Today, I'm in conversation with Adam McCauley, an artist from Northern Minnesota. He has received his BFA and MA from the University of Wisconsin in studio art and art history. Adam works with painting, collage, and sculpture. He currently works out of his home studio and shows work throughout the upper Midwest. Well, welcome, Adam. Thank you for uh, talking with me today and sharing um, your process around creativity and art making with our community. Um, why don't we begin? Uh, there may be several people in my community that are not familiar with your work. So um, talk a little bit about the mediums you work in and uh, a little bit about your process. Um, okay, so I'm primarily a painter, but I also work with printmaking, sculpture, collage, and drawing. So I kind of do it all. Um, I see my process is only getting bigger as time goes on. I'm using more and more, you know, different materials and figuration and still life elements are all coming into my work. I mean, it could just be, be because, you know, I haven't had an exhibit in almost two years. So I'm just kind of have all these ideas that are spilling out. Um, so I, my practice is actually really kind of big. You know, I, may, I mean, I make a lot of stuff and I make a lot of stuff using a lot of different materials. And, you know, it's been good for me as an artist. Um, it's not so good from like a gallery standpoint because gallery people come down, they look at how weird everything is and how, I'm, how I display things and how I think about art. And it can be a little bit, shocking to them like why doesn't he have a concise vision but i kind of see myself more aligned with like an outsider artist now hmm. where i'm making stuff just to kind of feed my own soul you know i mean the way i'm working now it's like really really obsessive it's really really spun out of my own imagination and i'm building up my own mythology um an example would be like, um, are you familiar with the artist Forrest Bess? I am not, no. He was an artist from Texas, self-taught artist, and he used a lot of symbols. And, you know, as we take a tour on my studio, I, I think you'll see what I'm talking about is that I use symbols in a way that I'm developing my own language. But then I'll, in the same day, I'll paint something abstract, completely abstract. And then later on in the day, I'll work on like a still life or, you know, self-portrait. So my practice is kind of strange. You know, it's evolving in, a, in its own way because I follow the work wherever it goes. So, so yeah, so I'm kind of a jack of all trades now, which is a little bit different from when we first met. True. But I'm still the same, I guess. <laughs> you, I think with creativity, like especially with like how I view my work is that I don't want it to be pigeonholed into, well, this guy's just an abstract painter or, or this guy just makes collages. I want to make it all. And you know, on my Instagram account, it's like the first thing it says is like, I want to paint everything. And, you know, I never have like a dry spell. You know, I always find something to paint. It's, it's really, I find myself to be fortunate in that. Excellent. So that's kind of my practice in a nutshell. Adam, when we first met, you were doing mainly uh, abstract painting. How, how did you become interested in expanding that into still life and figurative work? Well, you know, I do have a background in art history. So I, I spend a lot of time looking at art books and and I think, you know, I mean, everybody says it, you know, like that early modernism, you know, 1918, 19 to 1944, that was really like my interest in school, um, even though I'm very contemporary. Um, so I think just like going back through those books over this, you know, COVID period, because the still lives are kind of new, you know, and I mean, I think just looking at some books I just got inspired by you know like what can I say or what can I add to like the conversation about still life you know how can I make it different or how can I just put my own spin on it 
And then a lot of like my self portraits and stuff came out about, you know, just the whole nervousness about our time, like looking inward at like my own, like nervousness about, you know, I work in the restaurant, you know, I didn't want to go. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, all sorts of stuff like that. I worked in my son's school and, you know, I mean, one day we're in there and I'm teaching like an art school club and then the next day we're all shut down. So I think a lot of it has to come with looking within during, you know, what's happening in our world right now, which some could say is selfish, but it, it is a lot of fun still. <laughs> sure. Well, it sounds like, um, the whole pandemic had a positive effect on your art making. And instead of kind of stopping you and causing you to pause, you, you found different ways to um, take those feelings and energies and work with them. Yeah, um, that's kind of something I've always kind of used art as a, like it's more of like a diary of like how, even when I was painting like primarily just abstractly, um, it's always been a, you know, like kind of like a diary, like sketchbooks pay, play a really important role in my process now. Um, they didn't so much when we first met, um, but I mean, I'm drawing in sketchbooks every day and that's really has come about from, you know, like COVID-19 and some of the ideas make it into like a larger work, but it's, I like the freedom that it doesn't have to. So I think the sketchbook sketchbook you know sketching every day drawing every day since covid's happened i mean i've been you know all the work and you know just sitting around so it, it actually has had a positive impact on my work I, I would be interested to find out in your talks how many other artists it's actually been a positive work you know working situation for them yes and that that is something we're exploring a little bit <clears throat> to see how it affected them. You know, several people, um, they kind of stopped and then hit a point and regrouped and started working again. And um, I think you're the first person that has said it, it really kind of gave you a space to continue working, which I think well, is a really good perspective to share. Yeah, well, this isn't like the first time where my life has been um, turned upside down like this. Um, my wife and I, we had another son and he died. And um, during that whole period was like, the only way for me to express myself was through my work. And so while that was an extremely, you know, emotionally trying time and devastating to me and my family, like my work, like really, really, you know, pros oh, prospered I was it was a really positive thing in my life for my work, not for my personal life, but, you know, so I guess I've learned that um, the work is really like a place where I can speak freely for myself. It's like the only place in the world I feel completely and totally free to express anything I want. If it's a subject that's dark or if it's a subject that's light or anywhere in between. So is it <clears throat> safe to say that you use, like, life is, um, lack for a better term, your muse? Like your, yeah. your experience in moving through life is where your work comes out of, where maybe some artists are really intrigued by uh, landscape. And so they go out in the landscape and they, you know, it's something that they go to do. But it sounds like you really use, like, your everyday experience and um, you, your ideas and the way you process things come out of that. And that's where your art comes from. Um, yeah, you know, um, one of the biggest pushes for me was when I was working in my son's school, um, just seeing the art that kids make and how it actually, even though I've, you know, I'm well-educated in art, I, I actually learned more from that than I did from, you know, some of my professors. Um, so yeah, I mean, what my son does, what he's interested in affects, it all trickles in. I've always kind of, you know, compared myself to a sponge, you know, like I'm always just sponging up everything that everybody's, you know, somebody's like, oh, this idea sucks. I'm like, really? 
you know, I'm like, you know, I go over there and sponge it up, you know, or, or like my son says something, or I'm watching, uh, you know, like a video game he's playing. I'm like, oh, some, somewhere down the line, it just filters out, you know? So I guess my process isn't like, I've known artists who have sat and sat and thought and thought, and they're very, they're very thought oriented artists. And, you know, I've always admired that. But then in the other part of me, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to do that because I can just get to work, mm-hmm. you know, so. Could you expand a little bit on how, how kids have helped you or what you've gleaned from working with children in your own practice? Yes. Um, so for the past, I don't know, seven years or so, I've been doing workshops at different schools in uh, our local school district and I was teaching the um, student uh, art club at my son's school and the thing I probably affected me the most with teaching them is their use of abstract shapes. Um, I remember looking at one drawing it was just a circle in a square. I'm I didn't even matter what it was supposed to be. I was just like the way the circle is imperfect and the square is imperfect like was super like had like a super profound effect on me I was like wow that is just really great and I went home and I started painting like this circle and square and you know I just I basically you know took everything that that those two shapes could have and I just put it through like torture in my studio painting after painting after painting and it just was like one of those things where it like their language spoke to me it was like I went in there and it was like you know I was hit by like you know like the the fact that they're fearless like there was one kid in one of my classes he always wanted to talk about his work he was always making like just tons of stuff and it really brought me back to like my own beginning of art making like in school you know like where you have teachers who like you know I mean school is a very very difficult time I mean you have so many insecurities and different um you know feelings towards school and um you know to have like a sense of you know to have somebody encouraging you and saying that what you're making is good was like to me like you know the most the greatest experience I ever had so it really just brought back all these feelings and I, I don't even know if it's necessarily the work or like what the work symbolizes that struck me so much. But I mean, I can trace that moment to like all the work that I'm doing now. Uh, talk a little bit about your collage work. How does that in- influence your, your painting process? Well, while they're both like separate, like I really want my paintings to be paintings, like being about paint. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've said that for so long that it's kind of ingrained in my brain, but with the newer work, it's, it might be changing. I won't know about that till down the road, but I want my collages to be, well, see, I go back and forth because um, sometimes I want to integrate the collage more into painting, like, like, you know, like something that Rauschenberg would have done or Jim Dine, you know, and then a lot of times I want, now I want the collages to just be the paper themselves, like no altering. So I kind of, it's like a pendulum for me. Like, do I mix media in or do I keep it pure? And um, I have found myself recently, like taking like other people's images and then writing like fictitious narratives Hmm. to the work. Um, And I've gotten some really good feedback on it. It's, I mean, some of it could be, you know, kind of, kind of cheese ball, you know, I mean, that's what some people could say about it like it's an easy way to get a reaction from a viewer is to have an image then have something you know that's very vague written underneath it you know like like what julian schnabel did but you know i'm a huge fan of that kind of work so um i think that the collage when it comes to um to the painting i think all it does is open up more ideas like each piece is like more free you know like when I make a sculpture it's like I realize that it's like oh I can do this you know and it's 
I think for me, I put up these blocks in my head that, you know, I'm a painter, I can't do this. But now I'm, those blocks aren't there and it's, everything is informing each other, you know? So now when I look at painting, I look at it like, do I want this to be a painting or do I want this to be a painting object? You know, because a lot of my ideas with still life and especially with like landscape painting is more like making it like an object where I'm actually considering like even the framing, like on how I would present it. So I think collage has just freed me up. Uh, and now since I've been doing collage for so long and I've been in contact with other collage communities on online, it's, you know, I mean, collage is like everywhere. It, it is the world, you know, so, you know, how we view it, how we view the world. So it's, it's changed that as well. You mentioned that you you have written some narrative into other people's work. Um, do you find that uh, writing is part of your practice? Like in your when you're using uh, your sketchbook and doing sketches, do you write into your own work or? Make I notes? do, I do, I do write into my own work, and a lot of the writing I do is um, to give a place or a name to something like so I did these cactus paintings which you know like if you know if you saw my other work that we had at Banfield Lock you'd be like what <laughs> I so I did a whole series of cactus paintings and for some reason I felt like I had to write that it was a cactus on there and every little animal I put in there had their names on it and skylines because I think that somewhere in me like there's always going to be like that awkward child that finds that like weird handwriting on a piece is really appealing you know I mean I was a huge fan when I was in, col in college of you know Basquiat and um, you know Julian Schnabelev who I've mentioned before and I mean and all those guys wrote on everything you know well more Basquiat but I found that like labeling something allowed like the viewer to see it in almost two different ways like and what was surprising to me was that I actually was somewhat successful in them. And like off my Instagram page, most of those paintings sold within like a day, which is unheard of for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, I do, I do sell work. I do, I, I am in galleries and stuff, but I usually didn't have like such a, um, such a really great response to the writing. I mean, it seems like people can resonate to the writing on the paintings or the writing on the collages. It makes them feel like um, there's more to it. There's more of a more of a story, you know, more of a narrative. Um, it also adds another layer, especially if I, so when I wrote that cactus on top of the painting, it added that other layer. So now you're interacting in like two ways, you're reading and you're looking. And I find that that interacts in my brain somehow a little bit more fulfill, it's more fulfilling. Do you feel like your work is headed more towards a narrative, your paintings? Um, I would love to say that I knew where it was going, <laughs> but I don't, I don't. And I, I, it's, that is a problem for me. Um, I know that, you know, they want, they, they, <laughs> galleries, um, art professional people, they want you to have a solid statement, a solid, um, <clears throat> You know, they want to know where you're going. And I did this exhibit at the Duluth Art Institute. And I, I may have told you this before. And it was of silkscreen paintings that were all black and white, all based off of um, Philip K. Dick novels, which, which they were just really like the feel of it. Um, you know, like that real slick feeling that I got from reading his, uh, his work. And... Um, you know, and I was, I put them up there and we were sitting in front of the paintings and I was like, yeah, I think I could paint black and white from here on out for another couple of years. The next day I came down in my studio and all of a sudden like colors everywhere, you know, so, so much of my process is intuitive of following the work that, you know, I could say that it would be narrative, but it's probably going to be just, just in there somehow, you know, it's the, the, the work itself is the work itself. And I'm just here, you know, you know, I'd be interested in how many other artists you've met 
I mean, because I think like at this point, I would consider my practice really serious and not to have just this distinctive, like I'm not working on branding, you know, that's what I guess they call it now, <laughs> you know, your, your mature style and, and it's like, I just can't stick to it, you know. Sure. Uh, let's go back. You you had mentioned um, that you have worked in your son's school and you've worked with children in a school setting for a number number of years. Um, let's talk about like community and an artist role in the community. Do you have oh, thoughts on yes. that? I do. I do. Um, whenever, you know, an artist, you know, lots of artists I know, we survive off of grants and always with the with the grants there's always like what can you do for your you know how is this grant going to benefit our community and it's it's almost always like you know i'm going to go and teach this technique to you know these kids or i'm going to try to do this workshop in you know isd 709 or you know or, I'll, or else like now like i'll do like a zoom talk you know i did a zoom talk with um what was it like a hundred like third three third fourth and fifth graders uh you know this COVID period. And, um, you know, I think it's really important for artists to go out there. I mean, one, I think it's a good practice for artists. Like if somebody asks you to do something, if it's in your power, you should do it. Especially if it's like, you know, getting your ideas out there or, you know, just showing the community that like, you know, we're all artists, you know, we all can, you know, do this. We, especially for kids, I think it's important for them to see like, you know, role models who are like artists who are like, you know, because let me backtrack. So when I was a kid, I didn't really have role models like that. And so I was this artsy kind of weird kind of kid. And I was like, oh man, you know, I didn't have a place that I felt like, you know, in school that was my own. And then all of a sudden my friend was like, you got to take this class with with this teacher and it was like you know it was awesome it was like she gave so much to me that i feel like it's important to give back and you know usually i give that back give back to the community through you know workshops or you know teaching kids you know i mean i would love to find other ways to be more involved but i just uh, you know I, I don't know if there's any other way than you know teaching you know, like the skills that I have. Um, as for the the school work that I do, like, I think that that's actually not even teaching. I mean, I learn, I get so much from it. I get more from it. You know, I, you know, to see my friend, see my son drawing with his friends, making a comic book, you know, I'm sure I have to teach 20 other kids, but to see that even for a minute is, you know, more than enough reward you know and to see these kids you know and that's the thing is like so when I brought when I did this art club last time I brought all these like 18 by 24 canvases none of these kids wanted to work on the small things they just went straight for the big things and you know they're throwing paint around and you know not every work is going to be a work of art but you're I always find something and I'm like I can steal that I can take that I mean that's not always about me but you know I just really love sharing like what I what I know, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing. You know, you mentioned that um, you feel everybody is creative or everybody can be an artist. Um, how do you address the people that say, oh no, I'm, I'm not creative. I don't have a creative bone in my body. How do you, <laughs> how do you help them kind of bridge that gap and really show that, uh, that they do have something? Well, you know, last night I thought about this. I was like thinking about the first paintings I did and you know it's really hard like to come up with like an even an idea I remember I didn't have any ideas I was like what you know what am I going to work what am I going to make and now it's now it just seems so easy it's just you know it's like a part it's like my arm um so I would usually like when I'm teaching if somebody's not if somebody's not getting a um you know not getting an assignment or not understanding like what we're doing i usually approach it in a manner that's you know makes fun of myself you know i try to break down like the fact that like because a lot of times you know when i'm teaching like they're like oh this guy's an artist and it's like 
I'm just like you guys, you know, I, I try to break down that barrier. Like, you know, I mean, I like to draw cartoons just as much as you do. And that's how it starts. It starts out with something simple, going to, you know, something, going to a full-fledged artwork with kids. With adults, it's a little bit difficult, a little bit different because they have so many blocks up in their head, you know, up in their own mind. You know, I mean, sometimes it's easy to break down those blocks and other times it's there, you know, you're not going to be able to break them down and, you know, like the four hour session you have. Mm -hmm. But I find the best way to approach it is to demystify it totally. Like there is no, there is, I, I, some artists are just talented. I mean, we have to give it to them, but I think it's really just a stick, stick with itness. You know, if you want to be an artist, you'll be an artist. You know, even if you're not good, you will find your path. You know, you just have to stick with it. And that's why I found, you know, I mean, I was, you know, I had friends who were way better artists than me, but they've all quit. And I'm just like, I, I could never quit. So, you know, I, that's why I would say to somebody who's like, oh, I'm not an artist. It's like, you are, you just have to try and you have to continue. You know, we all fail. <laughs> I mean, I have a whole studio full of paintings that are failures. <laughs> so, so that's what, that's why I try to say in uh, the most positive, easygoing way that I can to people. You know, the, the idea of failure in uh, artwork has come up, <clears throat> I think, in, in every video I've recorded so far. And, <laughs> really? Um, yeah, I, and I think that's a really great aspect for people to learn is um, often the work that we see and admire in museums um, are successful pieces, but rarely do we ever see the failures of an artist and what they have gone through to get to that point. Um, and I, I like that you had brought that up. A another thing you had mentioned or um, kind of uh, indicated, and many other artists I've talked to have um, also talked about a sense of play. Do you find that that when you're working that there has to be some some element of play in what you're doing? Yeah, I see it as like a puzzle. Like in my brain, it's like, I'm not like, I don't think of it like, like this isn't how I think. Like I'm painting a painting and all of a sudden in my brain, I'm like, oh, I've got to do this. It's like, it's like this intuitive thing where it's like, I know I'm like five. I always think of it like I'm like five moves from the end. You know, I know where it's going. I know probably like 80% of the time there's always going to be you know those outliers that don't fall you know into like the normal pattern and you know I kind of would assume that this kind of is the way that I work is kind of like how like even like an author who writes a lot of books and is very prolific in writing writes like you know maybe he writes on book one on the first day book two on the second day you know, and he's thinking about book one while he's painting book two, like, hey, I'm like, you know, the puzzle is almost complete, you know, I'm figuring it out, you know, and so it's, it's not like a game, like, um, like Tetris, so to speak, but it's like, mm -hmm. um, it is, you are playing, and you're playing with the materials, like, you know, some artists say that the first part's the best, because then you can play with, like, the background, like, the surface, and you actually get to play with the colors, but I think of it as, you know, as all like play, like even like cleaning up, you know, I, I love the cleaning up part too, you know, and it's all because when I'm in my, when I'm in my studio and I'm looking around, it's like, I'm not really thinking like, you know, like, what am I going to eat for dinner tonight or anything like that? I'm just like, my brain is like, ah, and it's like, I'll see something from a painting out the corner of my eye. And I'm like, you know, I could be sweeping and all of a sudden I'm like, I got to put this on, you know, so-and-so canvas, you know, and as for failure, you know, I, I think one of, uh, you know, so I do a lot of workshops with this one art teacher named uh, Chrissy Valento and she teaches all that one of the middle schools in town. And that's the first thing she always says when she introduces me, she's like, she's like there with Adam, there is no failure. 
you know everything is just like how it's supposed to be you know and and i i think that that adds to like the play element of it because if there isn't any failure then there isn't any you know there isn't any reward in it you know and so much of abstract painting is like the layers beneath you know so i think failure and play go hand in hand with probably 80 percent of artists not for all of them but you know for a lot of them you know it we wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun but and it's it is the most it, I always, I always love those shirts that say like, buy art, not drugs. And it's like, you know, art is the most addictive thing that I've ever met. You know, I mean, in my life, I just love it. You know, I couldn't imagine my life without it. So what kind of um, encouragement or advice would you give to somebody that is young and, and thinking of exploring um, a life of creativity or uh, a career as an artist? What are some, uh, some advice? You know, I would probably, the first thing I would probably say is like, you know, you probably should find uh, something that you love just as much as art. Like for me, I've always loved cooking. I've cooked at, you know, some of the best restaurants in where I live, you know, and it's really, um, it was a way to create things, but also get paid because money is always, the problem with you know being an artist money and space and I guess time so there's three problems and you know I would I would probably ask them to consider like you know it's to be one of the top artists in the world like that is like so beyond you know there's so many things that go into that but like to sustain a practice that you could do like how I do it like that's not beyond you know, anybody. It's just, you have to be committed to doing it. You have to be willing to give back um, because when people do you favors, you got to do them favors too, because it's, you know, I mean, that's how the art world goes around. You know, like if somebody, you know, curates you into a show or is like, oh, hey, you should check out my buddy. Like you should repay those, repay those things. Um, you should be a good citizen, you know, art citizen, so to speak. And then I would, I would, probably tell anybody who wanted to be an artist to spend the four years in college you know at least for a bfa it's it was the best investment i ever did and i mean i went to a to a really small school um i went to uws over in superior it's small it was cheap the art department though was even though it was small like they you know we had one teacher who was he was an older person he had you know taught got taught from clifford still you know and, um, you know, those opportunities to be taught by really, really great teachers are still out there. You know, it, you don't have to go to New York to do it anymore. Um, you can do it everywhere. Um, and those would, that's what I would suggest to people, like, to invest in yourself. Like, if this is your dream and you really want to do it, you know, go to a college and try it out. You'll know within a couple of years if you really want to do it, you know. Because that's what, I mean, when I started, there was all sorts of people in my class. By the time I finished, we had dwindled down to, you know, five, you know, real artists, you know, all painting in the studio, all working off each other. And it was a, it was a great time. You know, I, I remember it really fondly. You know, I had a lot of fun and, and a lot of, that's kind of where it started. You know, the opportunity started for me. So that's, that's it in a long spiel, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing uh, about your creativity and your knowledge of the art world. Uh, why don't we take a, a few minutes and you can show us around your studio. Oh, there we are. So this is my painting table. And it's really large all the yogurt containers I got into using house paint which is not really a fine art material but for me it's a fine art material that's free <laughs> you know and so I, I like the price and I, I actually like how fluid the paint is so so it's worked out for me up here I've got a bowl of cherries well, a bowl of apples and I've got all sorts of extra paint so I do paint with you know, 
all the regular paints that everybody you know uses. I think my um, my material, um, the fact that I'm so comfortable using a material that's not a fine art material is through collage because you know collage has really um, influenced how I think. So then I've got another table over here where I've got some landscape paintings. You know, so this is a cactus painting over here. And then this is going to be like probably a bunch of foxes drinking out of, you know, like a, like a river. And I've got, you know, some abstract paintings up there that I use. Um, and then I, I don't, I'm in a basement, so I don't have a painting wall. So I set up all these two by fours across there to kind of get the paintings up off the floor. And that goes, you know, it's a pretty big room. Um, and then back here is like usually where I'll work on some sculptures and I have storage. So more two by fours, you know, hung up by paint cans. And then most of my sculptures are paper mache. I just really love it as a medium. And then I've got more paintings back here. And then, you know, so I get a pretty good, I have a wide field for like examining like paintings. And then I also work a lot on the floor. Like this is um, 12 paintings with different textures. I got really into like crackling effects. Like you can see probably better here. Got really into like a crackle effect over COVID as well. And stacking paintings together, to, like a lot of small paintings together to make a big painting. And so see more of that. So when I'm looking at work, I usually either look at it on this wall or else on the floor. Um, anything that's small, I'll just work on the floor and on the table that I have. So, and this is like kind of like more like the collage area that I have. So I'm kind of just laying out some collages while I was waiting. And like, this is one I'm laying out. I first look at like color relationships, like everything, you know, like, there we go. And this is probably the final part of my studio. Cause I usually count it like when I'm walking into this side of the basement is where I just have all my paper junk, which I love, you know, and that's about it. You know, I do everything in this space and I store everything. It's it's small, but I, I guess I said it was big, and now I'm saying it's small. But it it's <laughs> big for me compared to the other spaces I've had. So, and it's I've always had a home studio. It's always been something that um, that I've uh, used. 